And, you know, for me, it's really important for people to watch the movie in person together. I mean, watch it and then plan a meetup right after. Go and grab some beers, you know, like have a conversation. Come with your family, come with your friends and and stick around to talk, continue talking and continue that conversation. Welcome back to the Compass Mining Podcast. I'm Jared, and today I'm joined by the executive producer and director of Dirty Coin, which is a documentary that is now out. It's been out for a good amount of time, and it talks about Bitcoin and Bitcoin mining and the solution that Bitcoin mining really is providing globally for communities. So Alana, Mediavia, thank you so much for joining. Thank you. Thank you. Well, we premiered in April 20th, so not even that much of time in the film world, right? I... The fact that I'm going to theaters now, like now, we're, we're in theaters now, um, so check your cities. In fact, uh, this is going to be coming out on Monday the 23rd, and we're going to have a screening in Washington, D.C. that night. Then the Wednesday, we're going to have a screening at Pub Key, so check for cities. We're screening right now. Um, I had a lot of people uh, or other producers give me advice. I definitely called in all the mentorship calls, like, what do I do? What do I do? And a lot of them said, like, wait it out. Uh, submitted to Sundance, submitted to these festivals because we finished in April. So we missed out on all these important festival, film festivals to submit the movie to because we just didn't, we couldn't hit Southwest or South by Southwest. We couldn't hit um, uh, Cannes. We couldn't hit Sundance. We couldn't hit any of them. And they were like, hold the movie for another year, do the festival run, and then, you know, we'll see what happens. Maybe somebody picks it up or whatever. And I was like, yeah, but... I'm not quite sure if somebody's going to pick it up because I have been working on this for two and a half years and I have been pitching for two and a half years and people have been saying no for two and a half years, except for the fans, except for the people that actually are curious about this. And so I didn't want to gate it thinking, well, maybe one of the big fish wants to eat me because, or like eat me, that's not, not the right way to say it, but like <laughs> maybe somebody wants to pick it up. But I just, I don't know. I felt like we've had no joy so far and I didn't want to push it out another year. And so I was like, no, we'll do a couple festivals. We have done a couple, but they're not like the tier one festivals. Um, and we actually won best movie at the Bitcoin Film Festival on 420, 2024, um, which was our very first time screening it. And it was the day of the having in Poland. So it was just so poetic. You've already, I was going to be like, yeah, like, what was the route to get it seen by people? And I know that there's that whole festival route. You got to do this and that. But I totally love that you're just like, no, we need to get it out there. Because for me at Compass running media, I'll tell you, sometimes we get stuff and I'm like, for example, normally we launch podcasts on Tuesday, but you're like, no, let's do it Monday because we're going to be in DC. And then on Wednesday, we're going to be in New York. So we're like, yeah, we'll get it out. And the one thing I found, especially with Bitcoin content, is the second you have it in the chamber, you got to fire. Like if yeah. you, you can't hold on to it because things can change. And especially in the mining industry, one of my questions around is actually really specific to hardware after watching the video, uh, you know, the, the documentary. And I'm going to ask that in a second, but it's like, if I hold anything, even for 72 hours, I get anxious and I'm like, no, we just need to put this out. We need to put this out, which is, it's a double-edged sword. It means I don't really ever have too much in the hopper, but it also like, this is, a, it's like this anxiety that builds within me. And this is pretty behind the scenes on Compass Mining Media where I'm like, I need to constantly be doing more, right? And in media, yeah. in the attention world that we live in, I know we're going to talk about energy as probably the, the lifeblood of of humanity or civilization as it moves forward. But really, when you look online, I mean, attention is the new oil. It's the thing we trade, right? It's what allows Facebook to be where it is, Instagram to be where it is. I mean, I read a stat the other day that Instagram was bought for a uh, billion dollars in 2012. Most people know of that acquisition. And I now it's creating like, I can't believe they're paying that yeah. much money for a free app. Zuckerberg's crazy. Why did he do that? Yeah. And now, I mean, it, it, it grosses, I don't know, like 80 million, 80, excuse me, 80 billion a year. I mean, even more, I think so. And that's all based off attention, but I, I, I want to dive in and, and we're going to probably record this assuming that people have seen the film or they're going to see the film. And I say that because I don't want to have any spoilers in the film. I think even if I do spoil something, if you're a Bitcoin or a Bitcoin miner, you're still going to take the time to go see it when it comes to your city, right? But one of the things I was looking at, and this is also another internal thing coming from Compass, because one of the, you know, one of one of the challenges and also opportunities of hosting is the repair side. 
And I'm watching this footage of Bondo, Malawi. And for years, I spent time working in the rural mountainous regions of Guatemala. I was a Peace Corps volunteer. And I used to walk five hours to a school, no, four hours to a school and then four hours back because there was no other way for me to get there. Um, there weren't necessarily roads. It was just kind of like, yeah, go up that path. When you get to a tree, take a left. <laughs> yeah. You know, when you see the guy who's hurting the goats, take a right. And I eventually well, found my way to school. And so my question for you, knowing that like in my own personal lived experience that I've done that and I've been out in the middle of nowhere where there's no, at, at that time, there was no electricity in these villages. There was no running water. I don't know. Bondo's clearly not that remote because now it has electricity. But my question is, what happens to the ASIC? if it needs to be repaired. Uh, I, I have a couple of ideas in my mind of probably what's going to happen, but I would love to throw that to you. Having seen that footage and having lived that experience, and I heard you on, I think, the Bitfinex podcast talk about just how rural it was. And it's like, no, there's like not an easy road to get there. And you know, you're going to be in DC and then you're going to be in New York. I'm currently recording from Massachusetts right near Boston. And it's like, there's no subway. There's no Uber. Oh. And I just think so. If you could talk there's about no that, anyways, I, electricity. There's no. There, I mean, there's no roads. There's no these. These places are very remote. And in the case of Malawi, it's a, also a landlocked country. So it's a landlocked village in a landlocked country, but it has this river that they're able to harness power from. You know, harness the energy and create electricity. And you know, these projects, these um, these energy projects, are tough financially because. Who wants to give them a loan? Who wants to, you know, a, give? There's no return on that money. It's always like a, um, you know, a donation or like that, a grant or that kind of stuff. And the beauty of a Bitcoin miner being able to go right at that location in that super duper remote location that we're discussing is that nobody else is going to go there to buy that electricity. And the people still don't have enough electric items to even need the electricity. So the demand isn't there yet, obviously, because once they once they have a refrigerator in their house, once they have a fan, once they have a fan, it's, it changes a person's life. So in terms of repair, what I have, I can't speak for a grid list because this is, this is grid list, so I won't speak for them. So I'm just going to kind of speak for a lot of what I saw across everywhere because um, I don't know the day-to-day -day of each company. Each Bitcoin miner is a completely different person, a different company. It's a person with a computer on. And I feel like it can be anyone. So this is something that often it's like, how are miners like? And it's like, they're like, anyone. It's like saying, how are the people that use the internet? I mean, yes, we're early. So there are the early people that use the internet. Maybe we're nerds, but now everybody uses the internet. So a miner is just a person that is mining Bitcoin. It's just a person. And there's, again, the early ones were nerdier because they knew and they saw the value. But ultimately, I saw so many different types of people mining Bitcoin and even mining other cryptocurrencies as well. I just I focused the documentary on Bitcoin because then it was just going to be too many rabbit holes of like explaining different things. But, you know, there's tons of people that are using proof of work from like women, men, um, all ages. But in terms of repair, going back to your question, um, they repair locally. They repair at on site as much as possible. They get very good at, you know, reusing as much as they can, um, Frankensteining things together. Like I, I did see, um, um, uh, I did actually see this happening in Paraguay where they have a whole um, repair facility at the mining site. So everything is done there. Anything that's more intense than, you know, they have, this is like a secondary economy that has popped up, which is repairs. And there's a lot of repair facilities in the United States. There's repair facilities in, um, in, in, in everywhere. I, I, I met, I've met in, during the conferences and everything so many people that, that they, repair, they repair ASICs because the ASICs are still valuable. They're, the hash rate is valuable. There's no such thing as a zombie ASIC the way you have with data centers, right? You, you have that on, that thing is guzzling a ton of energy and it better be efficient. Otherwise, you know, you turn it off, you sell the machine, there's still, there's still an economy there. The, the, the machine still has value. So people do repair them um, way more than other technological f the industries that they just kind of, they, they're kind of, 
even us with our iPhones, I think we're probably more, uh, we treat them with more disregard than some Bitcoin miners that I met that treat each precious ASIC as like, we got to keep it running as best as possible. So, so yeah, so they learned how to fix it and, and yes, and then I have noticed like kind of like the secondary economy that has formed up around locations that have a lot of miners around. That's super cool to hear. And, and that's kind of what I assumed when in the times that I've spent in super rural areas where it's just like, no, there's only one, you know, somebody comes by in a pickup. And that's once a day. And if you're not on that, and even if you are, it's expensive and it's a long road and the time poverty, I know that you had Elliot David come on and talk about energy poverty, but time poverty is something that many people who are living on less than $2 a day deal with as well, which is just like, they just don't have time to actually make more money. Like people are like, Oh, well you just work harder. Like they actually can't even do that. So but going back to that, that's what I assumed. And we're just so early. It's kind of like when you live in the world we live in today, it's 2024. And if you drive a car around anywhere and you go to a gas station, most times, not all times, there's going to be a garage there. And that's because that's where the repairs happen. They're like, oh, we'll set up next to where people need to refuel. And then it, it just kind of like makes sense. But before cars, that just wasn't a thing. So I, I wonder to myself a lot, especially in places like Texas that have so much concentrated hash rate, especially in the United States landscape, if there's just going to absolutely pop up, you know, the computer repair, like, like, like there used to be in the, you know, at least in, in the town I live in, there used to be a computer repair shop where you could bring your computer down. Now it's a little bit different because we, our shipping has gotten better. We have YouTube and we have ingenuity yeah. and you can get next day shipping and you can get the parts and figure out how to do it yourself. But before that, so it's like, I wonder if in the future, in certain places, if there's just going to be whole, like you said, secondary economies. And, and I know for Compass, we have an entire uh, parts shop, which if you're stateside and you're a Bitcoin miner, you can get minimum order quantity of one all the way up to honestly, whatever you want, just reach out to us and we can help you out. And so I was always, I'm always interested by that because it's like, there's one thing to start a project and there's one thing to maintain a project. And sometimes yeah. the maintaining can be twice as hard. There's yeah. so much to kind of unpack. And you actually said something before we started to record, which now I want to dive into, which was not in my notes. And you said, you know, I think you said the stat was you had 56 different individuals come on to talk about Bitcoin and Bitcoin mining throughout the documentary in only a 70 minute documentary. Was that planned? Were you like, oh, I'm going to have 56 and 70? Or was it like, I had 40 and then, yeah. I interviewed 78. So okay. we ended up having 56, 54. I forget that. I forget, I forget that figure. But we had to cut out some people because it's a 70-minute documentary. We couldn't have put 78 people on. And um, everybody that I interviewed, I wanted to get uh, the full story, you know, and that is footage that we have. We went into some really great interviews um, and we had access to really great people at some of these conferences that I was like, you know what, we have time between this and this, let's just ask you about proof of stake, even though we're not going to be talking about proof of stake, for example, but you have the, the kind of pros that I was having access to and the conference organizers helping me like, okay, who do you, who, wh what's your wish list, you know, of the people that are speaking today? And we'll tell them that you want to interview them. And you know, and I was like, wow, well, you know, this person and this person. And at the end of the day, everybody kind of repeats themselves because there's only so many times you can describe in a documentary what is mining. But also I had to keep it very focused on understanding who my viewer was. And my viewer is not a very technical person. And I feel like um, we were talking about the fact that there is a lot of information out there. Like on YouTube, you can find so much information about Bitcoin mining already for free. That for me, I didn't want to make like a longer, better looking YouTube video. I wanted to tell the story of Bitcoin, the dirty coin. And with an emphasis and a focus on energy, because I feel like this is the latest like attack against Bitcoin is its energy consumption. But but the reality is that it's so cool. It's so much. It's so it's actually so fascinating that you can have this hungry little computer um, that wants to consume the cheapest electricity and is basically putting money into energy systems that had cheap power because they had nobody to sell it to. So this is, it completely changes dynamics in countries that are not competing for factories. You know, these are landlocked countries, Paraguay, Malawi, these, and there are more. And 
to be able to have a consumer come to you and you don't necessarily have to export your energy. It's very hard to export solar. It's very hard to export a wind. How are you going to send solar from Texas to, to Europe? How are you going to do it? But, but having, but you can use Bitcoin in Europe and use the energy from solar in Texas. So it's a really interesting um, system. And I feel like the more you understand and the more I unpack it, the more I'm like, wow, this is actually really fascinating. And where some people believe it, well, it's bad for the environment. Let's, let's look at that. Let's look at that one argument. And then let's go with basically what this is. But again, didn't want to get super technical because I knew I was gonna I was gonna lose people. <laughs> you know, I was like, okay, we need to explain it. But to kind of come back to what you were asking, I had to choose the interviews that explained it the simplest, that explained it the most concise in the most concise way. Um, a lot of people gave me great answers, but they were like six minutes long. And I can't have a person on screen talking for six minutes in a way that as a viewer, you don't feel like you know, and so I also had to then say, OK, well, sacrifice, kill my darlings, like literally kill my darlings, because I interviewed such incredibly smart people. And I just, you know, in the editing room with my editor, we would just be like, it's just too long. You know, like it's just too long. And how are we going to cover this with B-roll? Like what, I, we can't. No, we don't have B-roll. Like, no. And this person says it quickly. And the, the, they're in focus. It looks good. I mean, it just comes down to at the end of the day, you're making one movie. But yeah, it sucked to kill a bunch of darlings. But in the same, on the same hand, having a documentary with 50 plus people in it is also like more than your average documentary. Your average documentary will have like 12, 14, obviously depending on the documentary that are exceptions like mine. But if you look at your kind of regular documentary, like on Netflix, you have less people that you just kind of get to know, which is kind of nice. You know, you get you're seeing the same like few people kind of coming up over and over again. That's not what you see in Dirty Coin. You see you see people kind of like it's like rapid fire with a lot of different perspectives and viewpoints. And anyway, that was the route that I took. Yeah, I, I think it works out. It doesn't seem, now that you've said that like in a normal documentary or I don't want to say normal documentary, uh, the, the industry standard documentary, not that Dirty Corn's not an anormal documentary, but it's like if the industry standard is 12 to 14, it doesn't feel like it's three times more or three and a half times more speakers, which I think is kind of nice. And as someone who really enjoys documentaries, there's a couple documentaries that like live in my mind rent free when I was when I was just thinking about talking to you today and two of them, I'll, I'll call them out. I'm assuming you've seen them. If you haven't, I'll, I'll build some context here. One of them is Icarus, the one about all the doping that was going on in the cycling world. And familiar the other one is it? familiar with its enormous success, but no, mm -hmm. I didn't watch it. Okay. And then the other one is exit through a gift shop window, which is about the art world. Have you seen this one? No, through a gift shop window. No, I'm going to have to write this one down. Okay. Yeah. And I can send you them, but they're both, the reason why I say them is I bring them up because in those with Icarus, it's about a guy who's like a pretty good cyclist. And he basically wants to see how good he can get over a year as far as pushing his body. But what he stumbles onto in the end of it, like it starts there and where it ends is holy crap. There's a bunch of doping going on in cycling. Right. Mm -hmm. And then exit through a gift shop window starts one way and it just ends up in a completely different way. And I guess now I'm going to make up a hypothetical example. So you and I can hopefully be on the same page is like you and I are starting to do a documentary about uh, how malls are going to be falling apart in America because people just aren't going anymore because of the Amazon Amazonification of America. Let's say we start there, but then what we get into is like some crazy uh, money laundering ring that has to do with all the mall companies or something, right? So we've started with one thing being like, oh, are they going to use it for like nonprofits or nursing homes or storage units? And we end up with like, I don't know, some international money laundering ring, right? So yes. I, I, I was hoping you'd seen Icarus or one of those, but my point is, did you start Dirty Coin thinking one thing, thinking we're going to tell this story about Bitcoin and this story about Bitcoin mining? And did it end up like switching halfway through that made you actually change the entire 70 minutes or, you know, were you going to point A, but you ended up in point uh, D and that's okay as well? Yes. Yes. <laughs> <I> went, <laughs> okay. Yes. 
I mean, I, it wasn't on purpose. It wasn't like, well, I'm going to I'm going to say this thing about Bitcoin. I mean, I think in terms of the thesis, my thesis didn't change. Um, but how I wanted to tell the story did and how I felt that because at the end of the day, this is a very controversial story that in regards that includes a lot of subjects that people aren't really familiar with energy, money, crypto, environment, energy sources, sustainability, green, all of this has a cloud of misinformation or no information, which is sometimes just as bad, right? Because then whatever little butterfly of a headline goes, that's the one, the only thing that sticks that you know of it. So you have no information or you have the wrong information. Um, and that makes you behave a certain way. Um, and I think that adding more information just basically makes somebody more intelligent because they're able to uh, kind of make better, more informed decisions. I, before I worked, before I did this, before I devoted my life to dirty coin like I have the last two and a half years, <laughs> Um, I was, I, I, I was working at Google and I was working for Google cloud specifically. And, um, and I did a bunch of other work. I also had my agency. I would moonlight. I had worked at Google full time. And then I had my agency that I would moonlight and I would make films for tech companies in Silicon Valley. I was in San Jose. And every time there was this, this feeling of how are we going to communicate this, this, this tech story? Um, and how am I how am I going to get people to care about software, about code, about about, you know, and all these different clients? And it always comes down to the human story and who are who, what are the lives of the people affected? So when I started Dirty Coin, I wanted to tell the story of specific miners. I wanted to follow them around. I wanted to really look at, like, what is it to be a miner? But I never had the budget to do that. And so I started filming interviews to kind of show investors and, um, you know, pretty much investors, sponsors of the film. It, this, these, this is, these are the people and this is what is going on in this area. And this is why I think this is a good story. Um, and so I couldn't really do the documentary that I wanted to do because I never raised the money that I wanted to raise. But then... I, so I just didn't have the footage. So I just like, I didn't have the footage. I couldn't build the documentary that I wanted to do, but I still visited a lot of places. And I feel like that's what you see. You see a little bit of a lot of places and that's what I was able to film. And so in a way people watch the documentary and they're like, I did not know that there were all of these different case studies and all of these people doing all these things. This is crazy. And Again, I just, I believe that the future, I don't, I see the future and the future, we're going to be living with data centers. We're going to be living with data centers. Our homes, you go to a smart home, there's a server room in a smart home. And I'm sure technology is going to get smaller and smaller. You're not going to need as much, but our needs are going to increase. So now, yes, this technology is getting smaller, but now we want more hash rate. So, you know, we want more of them. So it always it all the consumption goes up and i also i do want to add this i think it's important i felt like the legis bitcoin nobody was paying attention to bitcoin because nobody cared and i felt like the regulation that was going against bitcoin was ultimately going to regulate com all computers all data centers and so your regular person is not concerned about you know data center regulation and their private data regulation or anything because they, they're not paying attention and but if it, they're attacking, but maybe they would, you know, maybe Silicon Valley would be like, wait, 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 no, 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 no. And they create a movement. But if it's Bitcoin, nobody creates a movement around Bitcoin. And other than obviously Bitcoiners, right? But but even then, we all have like, we're just people. I mean, there's no organization to to Bitcoin. It's it's everybody kind of for themselves and Bitcoin. And so there was this, this significant amount of information that was lacking. And I felt that we cannot regulate data centers, that it's going to affect our lives in 100 years and in 200 years without understanding and without knowing really what this is and not just go with, you know, Bitcoin mining is boiling all the fish in New York and this and, and lies. And so this is something that, you know, we cannot just, oh, well, oh yeah, Bitcoiners, Bitcoin bros, crypto bros, oh yeah, dumb asses. 
I'm going to see something else. Um, but then they they dehumanize the Bitcoiner when anybody and everybody is a Bitcoiner. And when you travel enough and you go to the middle of nowhere and a village takes Bitcoin at the shop, you realize that Bitcoin really is for everyone. And I, not that I needed that to realize that, but it's like it's very real that that Bitcoin is for everyone. So this de this characterization of the Bitcoiner and the fact that it's Bitcoin's bad and you know, their greed is 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 bad for the world and the environment. You can't say that without like knowing all of this other stuff. And people aren't going to do the research. I did the research for them and I made a movie so that they can watch it. But more than anything, I just want to make sure that we understand that the regulation that is open, the regulations that are going into place now are going to affect your usage of Facebook. Whether Facebook, your precious Facebook is free or not free, whether your Instagram is free or not free or just everything. I can't even imagine because I am humble enough to know that when I was in Silicon Valley 15 years ago, I wasn't expecting this life today. And I was in Silicon Valley working for a tech company 15 years ago. And look at us today. So I can tell you that I don't even know what the future is going to look like in 15 days. Are we going to give the keys to the growth of data centers to our politicians? I don't know about that. I don't, I don't think that that is like predicting and looking forward. I don't think that they know enough to make regulations and rules and banning and doing things that are that are basically just not going there are not going to be good for a country long term. And so I do think that this is a more than like, oh, it's, you know, dirty coin, aha. Uh -huh. But it's like, this is a really serious subject. And if I need to, you know, make a, a popcorn documentary to get people to look at something that they're not looking, then I will. But this is a very serious subject and also really interesting, fascinating, you know, doesn't have to be all doom and gloom, but there's a lot to this. And I know that my smart friends that have said before that Bitcoin is bad for the environment, they haven't watched Dirty Coin. That's kind of, you alluded to this earlier. You talked about the audience, the ideal audience, you know, the avatar audience. Who are you making this for? I think when we create content, if we think about who we're trying to reach, sometimes it, it can really help to actually make sure we reach that person. And then yeah. other people will gather around and be like, oh, that's interesting content. Who did you make this for? And I asked that because like, did you make it for the politician that's on the fence? Did you make it for the person as who's an investor who's like maybe I want to get into bitcoin mining but I'm I'm really worried about its potential impact on the environment did you make it for your friends so they can stop fudding bitcoin like who's the when you think about or at least once again this could likely an evolution you know did that change from when you started the project to when you debuted it on 420 talk to me about that okay so my my target was my friends my san francisco san jose silicon valley friends that whenever bitcoin would come up it would be like oh but there's this other crypto that's way better for the environment and you, alana this is the one that you need to look at because bitcoin is really bad for the environment and you know i'm at work and i'm like we're we're setting up the studio or something so it's not like i'm at work in a meeting but like I don't really want to get behind uh, Bitcoin, especially if it's like, you know, if, if it kind of compromises and puts me out in the open in terms of like how I feel about people being able to freely transact peer to peer. You know, I feel like it opens up a much larger conversation that I don't necessarily want to have at work, you know, like this. The libertarians at it again. It's like, you know, I, I just didn't want to have those conversations, so I would just let them go. And so at first, my target was people like them, people that I love and care for, but they um, are being kind of like, they're going very, very they, they because they're just on Facebook and Instagram, they think they know about a lot of things, but they just know like a little bit about all of, of so many things. And they don't know like a lot about everything. It's impossible to know a lot about everything. It's absolutely impossible. And these people have their own jobs. They have their own hobbies. They have their own other things that they're going to go an inch wide, a mile deep. Then you can't go an inch wide, a mile deep on everything. So for a lot of things, they're a mile wide and an inch deep. And so I feel like for me, it was like, let me bring you down a mile for a second so that you can see everything that's going on and then pop you back up. And then, you know, you make up your own mind about it. Like you don't need to, you don't need to change your mind, but it's like, a, ooh, you see all of this and then go. And it's, 
there's reviews of people saying it's impossible for people to not change their mind after watching the movie or a lot of that because we've been recording interviews and that would that, it wasn't my intention to do that i wanted to be to capture as much as i could um including like negative stories but the but i mostly wanted to really capture what was what was mining and it is a nascent technology so our data centers and it is which is why it's so important that we kind of let it grow um, organically and not controlled, which it will, and it is. Like, we don't have to let it do anything. <laughs> It'll, Bitcoin will do that anyway. Um, but, you know, it was like, I wanted to help them understand. But then my focus sort of going more towards Bitcoiners because I was kind of like needing their help. I needed their help to fund the film. I needed their help to sit on the chair in front of me so I can interview them or let me go to their facility uh, with a camera and a crew and a contract that says I will record and edit whatever I want from our doc from our interview. So I had to obviously kind of focus on the Bitcoiners for the last two and a half years. And that, that became my avatar. And uh, or, I didn't really have an avatar for the movie quite just yet. It was still a person that hasn't known about Bitcoin. But then it became the Bitcoiner's girlfriend or the Bitcoiner's boyfriend or the Bitcoiner's uncle and the Bitcoiner's aunt and the Bitcoiner's like the people around Bitcoiners. Because a Bitcoiner, again, is just a person. And it's just a person that understood Bitcoin enough to say there's something to this. That's it. That's what a Bitcoiner is. There isn't like club we don't like have an NFT. We don't have like, what is being a Bitcoiner? It's it's just somebody that knows and understands Bitcoin and thinks that this is a solution. You know, like it's it's like an interneter. <laughs> like, are you an interneter? It's like you use the internet, you have it. Like you think it's great, it's not great. It has all bunch of issues, but you are an interneter, you, you use the internet. And so that's kind of how I feel about Bitcoiners is like, I actually want to help them communicate because it's it's tough you know you're a bitcoiner you listen to or a person interested in bitcoin and you listen to a lot of podcasts like these you know you have hundreds of hours of information and if you're not a good storyteller which not everybody is i'm not you know not everybody's everything you're gonna have a really hard time explaining yourself to your family because it is complicated and you're gonna be talking about a bunch of things that they don't understand and and so my avatar changed from I just want the crypto bros to understand. I just want the tech bros and tech ladies to understand. I want them to see it and stop fucking spreading this, these lies about Bitcoin. Arrgh, you know, but now it's more like I want to I want to help the Bitcoiners communicate this. I want to that. So that has become more my avatar. Obviously, I want to get outside of the bubble because the bubble, as I've noticed, that it's very large, but it's also much smaller than than I thought. So it's obviously important to step outside of that. Um, but I do believe in the power of the network and the power of nodes. And there are a lot of Bitcoin meetups all over the world. And there's a lot of Bitcoiners that that put their time and they volunteer their time. They spend their money on these things, on their, on their podcasts, just because they want to like help the world understand this. And so... If I can give them these leaders something, and these leaders are everywhere, you know, these leaders are their their Bitcoin meetup leaders. They they're taking the the yesterday we screen stranded at a, at a university, and it was the blockchain or wait, I think it's specifically Bitcoin. Sorry, I did a blockchain club at another uh, university, and every single person that reaches out is a leader from a different place, from different colors, different color skin, different genders, all kinds of people are like, oh, no, no, can you can you come and do a Q&A or whatever? And now it's like, how can I help them? How can I help them do their job better? And that has become more recently, that has become more my my avatar is, is kind of just help the people that have already understood Bitcoin. And then they can fill in the gaps, frankly, because as you saw in the film, I don't get into how to use Bitcoin. I don't get into where to buy it, if you should buy it or any any of that. And so whether you can earn it, which is my favorite way of making Bitcoin, um, is earning it. And so, but I don't get into any of that in the film. I think that that's something that if whoever's interested, they can kind of figure it out themselves. Yeah, I, I think you've done that with the documentary because for me, it's like when I try to 
when I give up, when I throw in the towel with a friend and I'm like, I've known you for 25 years, right? You don't think I'm crazy. Can we establish that? Okay. You think that if I tell you, you know, when you're going to visit this country, cause I've been there, you would take my advice, right? And that would be your safety, your physical safety. Okay. So if I tell you that maybe you should buy $5 of this thing only because I think that will captivate your interest, even though it's only $5 that you'll start to look at it and learn about it. You won't do that. Okay. I totally understand that. Will you read a book if I buy it for you? Right. And I get there with people. Okay, sure. I'll, I'll read a book, you know? And then, so the Bitcoin standard, thank you, Syphid Ian. You gave that to the Bitcoin community as a tool to be able to literally bridge the gap. I think for cinema, like, like the movie now for me is going to be dirty coin because like you said, you don't talk about where to buy it. You don't talk about if you should buy it. You don't, it's really, you, I don't think you ever talk about price. You talk about Bitcoin and its utility. And going back to something that Elliot David said from the uh, Sustainable Bitcoin Protocol, who has also been on this podcast, we had a great conversation about what they're doing at the Sustainable Bitcoin Protocol. He talked about, and I have a way too many notes on this movie. He talked about, yeah, energy poverty, financial and, di and digital exclusion, I would, I want to kind of stay there a little bit because I think energy poverty is something that as Elliot points out, you know, affects a billion people plus and on the financial and digital exclusion elements of the film, was there a story that you hadn't really considered existed and then you like fell into it because someone was like, Hey, Hey, Lana, I think you should go look at that thing in this country. Um, if you could talk about that, I, I would love to know. I'm just so curious because you do travel around the world. There's Finland, there's Holland, there's Uruguay, there's Paraguay. You're up in upper state, New York, uh, Utah. You're all over. Montana was Texas. <laughs> yeah. Montana, just literally yeah. like the globe, like throw a rock and you probably stop by. But you know what? There were still so many places that I'm like, oh, fuck, I wish I would have gone to that place. <laughs> that's an amazing facility. Like there, there were so many places that I, but at the time, I mean, I, I, I always called it dirty coin. So I think obviously a lot of people didn't trust me at the beginning and which in a way was cool because I felt like the people that trusted me were the ones that I vibed with anyway. And I would, you don't want to interview somebody that doesn't like you because those are the people that then like pick apart your contract and then they pull out their clips and they're just a headache. And I've worked with those people before. In terms of the digital divide, I worked on a film on the digital divide. And that's something that, you know, when especially, well, I worked on it actually before the pandemic, which was already a problem. There were a lot of children that didn't have access to um, a laptop. And so this is something that Google then went ahead because Google has Google Classroom. And that is a tool that a lot of public schools use and private schools use. And a lot of kids didn't have computers. So Google went ahead and, and has for, for, for like a long, long time um, has gifted their Chromebooks to schools as a way of bridging that digital divide. Because the kid that has internet at home, that has a computer that isn't a, a shared by the other people in the house, you know, like the mother and the father and the, and the uncle and the sister and the everybody, um, we take it for granted because, you know, again, like it's just, you don't even notice how privileged you are until, until you like, open your mouth <laughs> and you're like oh, my phone's on a battery and you criticize other things like i mean the digital divide is is a, is a big problem but at the same time these kids also play more outside um these kids also you know there's other i don't think it's all bad i don't think poor inner city kids necessarily because they're living a great life they're all playing basketball they're not just at home you know on the computer again so it's it's a pro and a con i don't think it's but whatever I'm getting, I'm definitely going into a different subject there. As a mother of three, I definitely have an opinion on screen time and what it does to children. Um, but yeah, for me, the digital divide was something that the fact that financially there could be a finance, there is a financial divide. I live in Puerto Rico and there are financial tools that I cannot use because I live here. And I could in California, like Cash App. I can't use Cash App here. I can't. As soon as I changed my address to Puerto Rico, it was like, oh, it's not available in your region. And I was like, what? So suddenly I can't use Cash App. And there are a bunch in, in Puerto Rico, still the United States. 
Imagine when you go to South America. Imagine when you go to Africa. Imagine when you go to Asia. It's like, bro, no, it's Tether, it's USDT or USDC, and that's it. And maybe Bitcoin. But most people, they, you know, they have their diamond hands and they don't want to touch their Bitcoin. And so they'll have their, their stable coins that they move around. But I mean, to that, basically what Bitcoin and crypto did was, because I just mentioned stable coins that are not Bitcoin, um, although there's some recent news on that, but, you know, let's not, again, go <laughs> on that tangent. Um, it helped bridge the financial divide as well. And that is revolutionary. And so that's something my, my co-executive producer, um, I'm a little bit, I'm, I'm a Bitcoin most minimalist. I really just kind of focus on Bitcoin, but he, he's so wise and he, he's been around Bitcoin and crypto for a while. And he was like, you know, when I, back in my day, there wasn't this division of Bitcoin, not crypto. It was crypto, not the Fed, <laughs> crypto, not the central banks. And I feel like in a way we've, um, Bitcoin maxis sometimes come off so sh so so um, unpleasant that it makes a, it just alienates crypto. And I understand why they're unpleasant, right? There's there's a lot of scams that people have lost a lot of money, and it's frustrating to see your friends lose money. And it's like you, it's, it's frustrating to be right all the time, you know. And people just don't listen. <laughs> so I completely understand, but. I just I do think it's important to um, not create this division because what happens is you go to crypto conferences and there's no Bitcoin talks. There's no Bitcoiners there. And so like I was at consensus and I was surprised at how little Bitcoin there was at consensus. And so I, I think that the maxiness in a way has kind of like created this huge division, this chasm. Again, for good reason, not criticizing it, but the old, the unintended consequence of of that um, has been no no mixing, no no bringing that Bitcoin information into the crypto world and understanding that you know the tech crypto tech founders or crypto founders are trying to solve solve something the same way that Silicon Valley people made a bunch of apps you know and there were there was this like gold rush for apps for the iPhone I mean and a lot of them succeeded and are still around and, and most of them didn't so I don't know I feel like. I think that crypto and Bitcoin has definitely um, helped bridge the digital divide, the financial divide, and with mining, the energy divide as well. So the energy poverty. So you're going to find places that are going to be first, first affected by mining. And this is why I'm actually more bullish on mining than even Bitcoin. And that's, you can only imagine I'm pretty bullish on Bitcoin. Mining <laughs> will change somebody's whole life. Their grandma's life, their mother's life, their life, their hospital's life, their library's life, their market's life, everything without ever knowing what Bitcoin is. And I don't know if you caught that in the movie where um, the, 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 the DP, that the director of photography that was interviewing her says, have you ever heard of Bitcoin? And she was yep. like, no, I've never heard of Bitcoin. She knew about the machines up on the, on the mountain, but she's never heard of Bitcoin. Like the machines that are giving, that are changing the life of th the course of history of that village, she has no idea what Bitcoin is. And I, and that's, and by the way, Gritless is doing a great job. Dirty Coin screened in Bondo. So that was our second screening. So we definitely want to make sure that it doesn't stay that way. But, but the reality is that their life was affected before, you know, they even knew what Bitcoin was. And that's what we're seeing when you see a new substation, when you see that there's demand response, when there's less brownouts. Everybody's going to feel the effects of a properly utilized um, Bitcoin mining integration into the energy system. Everybody's going to feel that before they ever own any Bitcoin, transact on a technology that is using Bitcoin um, to, to make that transaction happen. Um, which is probably going to be the second way people are going to interact with Bitcoin first without also ever knowing it. Um, but yeah, I think that mining is, is I'm, I'm bullish on mining. There's a lot to unpack there. And I know that we're kind of time constrained today, which is super unfortunate because I feel like we could talk for a long time. One of the things we're not going to talk about, but I could talk about with you for hours is how absolutely bullish I am about Bitcoin in Latin America. I know you're in Puerto Rico, which is more than, you know, that's the top of Latin America. People say Miami, but I'm like, nah, it's really Puerto Rico for me. Um, her name was Bertha 
and she's the electricity committee member. And she said something like, you know, what happens here, meaning mining is also happening abroad. Meaning like that was her sitting in, in her community in Malawi being like, yeah, what's happening here? People are doing abroad. Like I'm part of a bigger network. And then, yeah, they said, oh, you know, have you heard of Bitcoin before? And she was like, no, I have no idea what that is because she had totally separated Bitcoin from mining and from the utility that the mining had brought to the village, which I just was like, that was, I mean, like I have notes for days, but that thing really stuck out to me because I think that there's, and now I'm going to go on a minor tangent, but I used to, when I was in these villages, we would, uh, we were doing health work. And so one of the things I was tasked with was talking about AIDS. And there has been a really, really cool nonprofit years ago, I think in like the 90s. And they were like, okay, how do we solve AIDS? Like, we need to be able to talk about this. But in many places in Africa, it was super taboo to talk about sex. You just cannot do that. You don't do that. I've always said where there's more, where there's a lot of children, no one talks about sex. Where there's no, uh, yeah, yeah. Where there's a lot of children, no one talks about sex. Where there's no children, everyone talks about sex, right? And if you go from a village wow. in many parts of rural world to New York City, you'll know exactly what I'm talking about. But the point was, wow. there was an entire curriculum that was created to talk about AIDS and AIDS transmission without talking about sex. So you could have proper education in classrooms. And that's what exactly what hit me in that moment. It's like, Dirty coin or, or Bitcoin mining, I guess, is the way to talk about the benefits of Bitcoin without talking about Bitcoin, which most of the movie, not most of the movie, but here and there in the movie, you bring in all the FUD narratives. You talk about Silk Road. You, there's, a, there's a clip of Elizabeth Warren talking, being like, this is not good. There's Jamie Dimon on the, on the floor of the Congress being like, I think the government should ban it. So I, I thought that also set with me too. And if that's one thing I take away was that woman saying that. Um, I want to ask you, I have two questions to ask you. Uh, first is, hopefully su super, super quick. Can I do a filming in uh, Bogota, Colombia? Yes. And will you have, do you have something with Spanish subtitles? Yes. Okay, that's easy. Done. Yes. My next one is kind of a philosophical one, but it's one I was thinking about listening to you on other podcasts and kind of following your story. How do you think, and you have three children, how do you think their children are going to think about their grandmother. Is she going to be, this is like in 25 years and this is kind of a weird question. Is she going to be a Bitcoiner or is she going to be a documentary filmmaker if you had to choose? Huh. A documentary filmmaker. Okay, cool. Yeah. I mean, what's so, what's funny is that the kids totally know I'm a Bitcoiner, right? Like look at my water <laughs> bottle. My water bottle is covered in Bitcoin stickers, which is like a security risk, honestly. In the it bull is. market, I will <laughs> change my water bottle uh, and i think i have more stickers of bitcoin than i have like bitcoin so definitely should change out the water bottle um and they the kids ask me all the time when i tell them like we're gonna like let we, i need to make 10k by the end of the month right and they'll be like like 10,000 bitcoin <laughs> no so i think that they're not gonna see my kids don't see bitcoin as um a bitcoiner they see it as a tool you know like they probably wouldn't think of me as a as a carnivore they would just think of me as somebody that enjoys pork <laughs> chicken you know like mm. i think that for, when it comes to them they don't they don't they already see the utility in bitcoin um they have seen it when we have traveled, they have been able to go to places and be like, what well, we can use our, like they're, they're, they're like stuck with whatever money they had from the last place that we were in or, or from here. And then they'll be like, and I obviously I'll go to Bitcoin places that merchants that accept Bitcoin and be like, wait, so I haven't changed my money and I can just pay like right now, like, whoa. And they, they you know, they use their lightning wallet and they pay. So I, I think that they're just going to see Bitcoin as a as like a normal thing. Uh, and they're going to think it's weird when other kids don't see it normal, which it already happens. Like, you don't know Bitcoin? What? Like, how do you even exist? Because in our house, it's like, you know, I it's the cost of Bitcoin. It's the it's on my on my phone right there. Yep. So when they pick up the phone, they'll be like, Mom. It said six. Actually, my son was like, it said 63. <laughs> so I was like, it's going to stay at 58 forever, son. <laughs> like, this is just what's going to happen. And he was so stoked. So I don't know. I feel like they're going to know I was a Bitcoiner um, or I was a person that, you know, kept her, that used it, believed in it, ran a node, 
you know, home minor. And so they're going to know that. Um, but I would say philosophically, I would say it's the it's the filmmaker part that they get to see me like struggle more, you know, do like have to come up with more solutions and like because Bitcoin, I don't really have to do anything about it. <laughs> It just goes. But my movies, on the other hand, I have to do everything about it. And so that's like where my energy goes. And then just Bitcoin does what Bitcoin does. I know that we're going to be Question launching this. Though. I think you said, yeah, well, I, I was thinking about it because I, I start to think too. And you actually brought something up about the water bottle. And I really, I've talked to a lot of people and it's like in five years, I don't think I will be public at all. Uh, for just for strict safety, anyone who's in mining now or who's in Bitcoin, just because if the price does what it does, people are just going to assume they're going to assume that you have money, whether you do or you don't. Right. So yeah. that's a whole nother conversation. I'm sure we could dive into <laughs> as well. Um, but I, I would agree with you. Yes. Yeah. I mean, that's something whole, whole different thing. Um, you had mentioned earlier that this will come out on Monday, the 23rd. That is totally going to happen. I will see see to it that that happens. And that that night you have a showing in DC. Yep. And then on doing some math, on Wednesday the 25th, it will be in New York City for people to watch. Other than showings, how else can people see it? So right now in October and November, we're going to have showings all over the world. So we're going to put out 1,000 or 2,000 screens. And if we sell enough tickets, the screening happens. If we don't sell enough tickets, the screening doesn't happen. But we're going to make a bunch of them, a bunch of these screens available. And um, and also people can request a screen in their area. So they can say, I live in X place and I there's a theater next to me all through our website. Um, and I will request that we watch that we watch the movie that day. And so we'll create a page for that, obviously all automatically so it can scale. Um, and then, you know, we help promote it so that it can happen. And then if we cross a threshold of tickets sold, then the screening will happen. And, you know, for me, it's really important for people to watch the movie in person together. I mean, watch it and then plan a meetup right after. Go and grab some beers, go or tea or water or whatever. I don't want to encourage alcohol use necessarily, <laughs> but I'm fine with it. But um, go hang out and talk about what you just saw. Go ahead and you know, like have a conversation, bring your electrical engineering friend, <laughs> bring your, your like bring your engineer's friend, like come with your family, come with your friends and, and stick around to talk, continue talking and continue that conversation. And I do think that it's very different than watching it from home. I want to bring people together. I think that there's a lot of power that happens when people are in the same room and like who is going to be in that screening and that in that movie theater with you? It's going to be a lot of other curious Bitcoiners, Bitcoin miners, uh, uh, people that are like, they just want to know more about it. You're going to be in that room and you could be the Bitcoiner that also helps orange pill the person in the room. Who knows? Who knows? Maybe maybe you meet the person that convinces you not to like Bitcoin. Who knows? Right. Like you. But you go and things will happen. And that's something that I see on the screenings that we've had is that is so powerful to bring Bitcoiners together because Bitcoiners are truth seekers. They like to find things out for themselves. And so it's this like chaotically amazing phenomenon that occurs when you put all those people together where suddenly, you know, they're they're solving, they're talking about seed oils. <laughs> you know, they're talking about like all these other things that like help your life, like help you be healthier, help you live a more sovereign, more independent, more, you know, flourishing life. And so I want to really encourage the in-person screenings as much as possible so that the unknown can happen. The known happened. I already did the known is the movie, but at least for me, it's known. But the unknown, like the, I, we met, I bet my business partner at your screening, I met my partner at your screening. Ah, that's the, that's the unknown that I'm very excited about. Um, but then after that, we are going to use, go with a distributor that they're going to sell it at different markets for us. So, you know, hopefully with our theatrical, we have made our money back. That's my my hope and my dream. And then uh, once we, you know, go into airlines, we go into, obviously, we'll see if they'll buy it, of course, but we'll go into film markets and they'll represent the movie and the movie will be in like TV channels. It'll be in um, just different regions around the world. We're definitely going to take it international because it's an international appealing subject. 
Um, so we're going to do that. And then eventually we'll hit streaming in 2025. So for the moment, we're going to really focus on in-person. Then we're going to focus on get making it available for as many ch ch uh, channels and um, syndications as possible. See what bites and hopefully a lot bites and hopefully the the buzz that we build from the theatrical release creates uh, more of a demand um, in that next step. But all of these are, you know, scenarios. I have different scenarios. I have scenario A, we we kill it in the theater, and then we get a great offer for exclusivity and probably one of the streamers. Um, or B, we, you know, we still generate a buzz uh, because we will. We already are. And then we hit the markets and we just kind of piece together different channels and different uh, people like licensing at like 20K here, 30K here. So it's, you know, it's it's a longer tail. But yeah, so that's like the business side. And then we'll get into streaming. But hopefully, yeah, if we have a really, really killer theatrical release, we could easily have um, one streamer want to come and say, you know, we want to have exclusivity. But it's fine if if they don't, because scenario B is still super rad and a lot more decentralized, which means that the movie would be available in more places. Um, it's so, yeah, so I'm, I'm kind of letting God guide me there when we get to that point. But for the moment, God is guiding me to get people together. <laughs> and so that is what I'm focusing on right now. And then, and then, yeah. And then once, once we're done with that phase, obviously not everybody can, it's not going to be available in every single city then we'll make it available in other ways. I love that. I think Andrew Birchwell, who is the executive director of the Ohio Blockchain Council, he said on one of our most recent podcasts, he said, Bitcoin is a better way to do community. And that's exactly what you're going for. So that's that's wonderful. Um, I'm thinking about adding into the episode descriptions your LinkedIn the Dirty Coin X account and mm -hmm. the website. Are there any other things I should add if people want to get in touch with you or, or learn about the video or follow along? Um, YouTube, well, we just launched the Facebook, like I told you. So, well, like I told you before we started filming. So Facebook would be a good link to have. YouTube, LinkedIn, X, that's it. Um, yeah. Oh, we have our website too. And our website has blogs. So if there's any blog posts there that kind of calls your eye or just the whole blog page, if they want to see blogs or if anybody wants to see blogs. But other than that, no, I mean, once they hit those, those major links, what, if they're interested, they can like keep digging and they'll find some good stuff. Excellent. Well, this has been wonderful. Like I said, even before we started to record, I was like, you and I could talk about so many things. We don't have all the time in the world, unfortunately, we will probably hop back on maybe in the future, especially maybe in 2025, because I personally yeah. would love to know what the uh, streaming plan is. And just in general, like I said, I think that this, if the Bitcoin standard is the book that I recommend, this will be the video that I recommend for people to kind of wrap their head around the benefits of Bitcoin, which I, I think is Thank pretty you. cool. And so if you are watching this on YouTube, please subscribe. If you're listening to this on a podcast platform, please go ahead and subscribe. Follow us at Compass Mining on X, LinkedIn, and YouTube. And Alana, thank you so much again for taking the time and good luck. This will be out on Monday, September the 23rd. And thank you so much again for your time. Thank you. Thank you so much.